This is Taking the Lead, a podcast for B2B tech professionals, leaders, and executives who want to learn from female icons in the tech industry. In each episode, host Christina Brady interviews women who are driving revenue for some of the most respected tech companies in the world. Are you ready to get inspired? Hello, everyone, and thank you for being such incredible listeners and working with me to elevate the voices of these incredible, iconic women in tech. This episode is a little bit special. If you know from listening to my show, I interview the dynamic and wonderful female revenue leaders that are working at B2B technology companies across all different departments and all different roles of seniority. And for this one, I was lucky enough to be interviewed myself by none other than Justin Brown over at Motion for their show, Recorded Content. And I thought that it would be special and fun to kind of break down a little bit of my journey, how the show got started, the way I think about the future and what is yet to come. So if you are interested in hearing about my journey, my story, why we do this show, where it is going to go, and even some nuggets about how you yourself can start to create content and put your beautiful content out into the world, then this is the episode for you. Thanks, everybody. Hey, this is Justin Brown. I'm the co-founder of Motion and your host for this episode of Recorded Content. Recorded Content is brought to you by Motion, a done-for-you podcast agency for small, scrappy B2B tech marketers. Today, I'm pleased to welcome, for the second time on this show, Christina Brady. Christina is the host of the Taking the Lead podcast that's coming up on its two-year anniversary. Over the last two years, Christina went from being a customer of Motion to bringing her show under our umbrella of shows at Motion. Taking the Lead, just to give you some background, is a podcast for B2B tech professionals, leaders, and executives who are looking to learn and be inspired. In each episode, Christina interviews one of the top female icons who are at the forefront of revenue teams. Through highlighting their unique stories, journey, wins, and challenges, taking the lead helps tech professionals understand the industry, trends, and how to navigate the B2B tech landscape. Now, the reason that I brought Christina on today is really twofold. I, of course, want to hear about her growth as a podcast host and some of the lessons and takeaways from two years on the air, but I also want to dig into how she's been able to be consistent with a guest-based interview podcast every other week for two years. Podcast after podcast I see out there in the B2B landscape struggles with consistency, yet through everything, through job changes, and other things, Christina has kept her pedal to the metal and kept on pushing with her every other week show. So with that, and without any further background, let's bring her in. Christina, welcome to the show. Hello, Justin. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> yeah, how was that? Uh, how was that intro? Uh, I think the audience might know that I know a thing or two about you at this point. Oh, it was so good. I mean, <laughs> it, it it got me a little bit like, Ooh, which is always a good intro when you start to feel a little like, oh, very seen in a good way. So I <laughs> loved it. You're a pro. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I want to start there and with your journey. I think it'll be good to give the background, give the audience a little bit of background. So Two years ago, how did you know that podcasting was something that you wanted to do professionally? You know what's crazy is, and maybe this isn't a popular answer, I didn't know that podcasting was something that I wanted to do professionally. So my background before entering the professional world, I studied theater, I studied film acting, I studied improv, uh, I performed all over the city of Chicago, and I'm in a couple of like weird commercials that hopefully nobody will like ever find again. And I always encouraged the people on my team, especially those who were customer facing, to take improv classes and just put yourself out there in that way. And I've always enjoyed being on stage and sharing my thoughts and interacting with people and just being what I call maniacally curious about them. And so when the idea of starting a show to really make an impact in the B2B SaaS DE&I space, when the idea came up to start a podcast and feature these incredible women, I was like, oh, yes, I think I can do that. Let's give that a (laughs) shot. So I, I mean, it wasn't like I went into it like I... I'm going to be a podcaster. This is the time. It was like, it was presented as an idea. To me, it was this checked the box of me fulfilling my passion of talking and learning about incredible women in this space. It checked a box of being able to put incredible content out. And so I said, sure, why not? Let's do a podcast. And it's, it's, it's been amazing 
And your company's made it so easy to get it off the ground and feel supported. And this is not a commercial. I really mean <laughs> that. It's been it's been awesome. So yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. So when the idea came up, how did how did you feel about it? I I imagine you were at least a little excited with a background of being on stages or behind a camera. But has it all transpired the way that you thought it would? It's been so much better. I mean. I was excited. I couldn't tell which I was more. I was either really excited or really, really nervous because at the end of the day, we all want people to enjoy listening to us speak. But I was terrified that I would go into the realm of pontificating or create boring content or not be able to get what I wanted to out of my guests. And you're, it, bottom line, you're like, anytime you're putting any kind of content out, you're like, what if I suck? Like, what if I suck? And then I just have all this stuff out there that sucks. So I was half really, really nervous, and then half just excited because I said, it doesn't just impact me if this content doesn't resonate, it impacts my guests and they're trusting me with their stories. And so I needed to be able to do that justice. Yeah. And I'm sure some of those feelings of, is this going to be good enough? Are people going to care? Also led to some of, you know, you doing enough homework to make sure that it got there. And not just thinking, hey, I'm just going to put something out and it's going to get the job done, but really trying to put something out there that people were going to care about. 100%. And that's the big thing with my show is, one, so many of the times that I'm having conversations with the incredible women that I have on my show, the brilliance truly pours out of them. And the first time that you do anything is usually the best time. It's the most passion. It's super authentic. And so I also wanted to be careful to not cross the line of being too overly prepped and having answers that felt generic or rehearsed. Like some of my favorite moments from the show were the moments that were completely off the cuff that we laughed about and had a real laugh about or real moments on the show where I'm learning something from them. And so what it means is I have to do this this balance between doing my research and making sure that my guest feels confident and prepared, but not rehearsed. So finding that balance has been interesting. And how have you seen yourself over two years evolve as a host? I would say I've gotten a lot more comfortable. And the thing that I've gotten more comfortable with is actually injecting a little bit more of me into the show. I would say the first couple of episodes, I was so careful to really highlight my guests and pull out their story that there's not a whole ton of me in there. And honestly, that's fine. There doesn't need to be a lot of Christina and anything. But over the last two years, I've sort of found my ability to share my own thought leadership and my own ideas and my own stories without crowding my guests or making them feel like suddenly they're an audience listening to me. So it's been sort of, I guess, creeping in and figuring out where do I fit in within my own show without taking over the show or or trampling on their narrative. Yeah, it's such a fascinating dichotomy of interviews. Yeah. You know, I have customers who have have to be by the nature of their profession more of reporters in their space. And I'll give an example, you know, I have I work with a person who is a marketer by trade. He was a copywriter and a very good copywriter. And he took, you know, a head of content job and he's in the financial technology space talking mm. to like the CFO of Peloton. And so for him, you know, he's not a financial person by trade. So he has to serve as much more of like, I'm going to ask my questions as if a news reporter would. And then I have other people who have the ability to you know, really be subject matter experts in different spaces. But I think one of the things that I find most fascinating is when you do have these people who, you know, going to go back to that first example, after having 20, 30, 40 conversations with CFOs, even though he's a marketer by trade, he does start to have at least opinions on things. And I tell him this, I'm like, you know, you've had conversations with 40 CFOs, I'd say at a bare minimum, the knowledge in your head of what CFOs think on topics at least can give you the ability to chime in on certain things. So I really enjoy watching people have that evolution of, I'm here to ask my questions, I'm here to talk only about you, to then starting to put themselves into the conversation a little bit, because it's also more fun when you can give your own opinions on things. 
100%. And it keeps it interesting, actually. I mean, watching people and listening to two people converse in most cases is really fascinating, right? And there's this sort of unknown and where's it going to go? And is somebody going to say something that's uncomfortable or is somebody going to say something that's really edgy? And then what's the other person going to do with that? And so absolutely that authenticity that was like a goal of mine, but it I don't think it happened on day one. Not that Not that my first couple episodes weren't really authentic, but I did have a bit more of a guard up of like, I've got to get this right. It's got to be perfect to now it's just I'm going to show up with my full self. And it's OK if weird things happen or we say something <laughs> off the cuff or like my kid barrels in the room naked. Asking, asking if they can eat bugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This morning we made gummy <laughs> bugs for my four year old in an attempt to distract him long enough to let me do this. And of course, as we're starting recording, he screams up like, mommy, can I eat the bugs? Which is yeah. it's like a weird thing. But you're like, so you just start to embrace that. And then you connect with other people when you do that, because other people can relate to tiny flaws. Yeah. And for a long, long time, I definitely had that imposter syndrome yeah. with our first show. So we had a show called Tech Qualified before recorded content. And I was interviewing CMOs and SVPs of sales about more about their their roles within B2B tech companies. Now, I am a co-founder of a services business. I work with B2B tech professionals in sales and marketing, but I didn't see myself as being able to have much input into their answers. And I really felt like I was hosting this show where I could only ask questions and couldn't give my own input. And I think a little over two years ago or somewhere around there, probably not much longer than your show, we pivoted our show away from Tech Qualified and onto this new show, Recorded Content, that is about B2B tech marketers and podcasting. And even then, when we first started, I felt more comfortable with the content, but I still served as kind of this arbiter of asking questions. And now, as I mean, as you can hear me kind of opening up right now, you know, I just feel much more comfortable in my show. I have more fun being able to talk about things from my perspective, even when I ask questions and finding the ability to do that where you don't make the guest feel uncomfortable or that you're trampling them, I do think makes the show a little bit more fun. It does. And it also keeps the conversation going. You get to the point where it gets stale for everybody in the room and everyone listening when it's, I'm going to ask you a question and you're going to answer them. I'm going to go, oh, wow, that was a great answer. Next question. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like we hear it and you're like, I I'm not here to interview people. I'm here to have a conversation. And within that conversation, we're going to uncover so many things even me and my guest don't know where we're going to go. But then the more you start to contribute, I find when I would start to tell my own stories or my own ideas, I would see their body language relax a little bit and they'd sit back. And I was like, now we're just two people talking yeah. about cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, I've had this question to me before. There are shows out there, and this is how Tech Qualified was for the most part, where you ask like this set uh, list of questions because everybody pretty much has the same background. And that's what I was doing. And it was just like so mind numbing after I'd done a hundred episodes of that, asking the same 10 questions of like, how does sales and marketing interact at your organization? And I'm like, and, and, and the thing is, is I got a lot of positive feedback on the show, but I just wasn't enjoying it anymore. I was like, I can't ask this question again or I'm going to put my head through a wall. Well, that, I mean, you actually just hit on another really key piece is that you have to find a way to look forward to every episode because as the host, we have to show up. We have to bring the energy. And that sometimes means that we're putting down a really hard day or it sometimes means that we're digging into a topic that maybe we don't know or we're somewhat uncomfortable with. And so I think you actually it's it's great advice to make sure that going into every episode, you're setting up a scenario where you can be really comfortable with the content and you're excited to dig in and you're not like, okay, here we go. Let's talk again about how we're all working in silos and how to yeah. break down those silos. And it's the same content over and over again, right? Like we can do better than that. And where I get really excited about episodes, you know, you heard, we, we joked about it even after I finished was my intros. You know, I really work hard at those intros to these shows to make sure that I'm setting up you know, what is this episode about and how is it unique in its own way? You know, I know you have your guest profile and we're going to talk about that 
to continue to get into that, you know, mine is a lot of times talking to other B2B podcasters and I never, I try to never jump into an episode. Like this is another episode interviewing a B2B podcaster. It's okay. I'm talking to Christina today and Christina is the host of the taking the lead podcast, but what specifically, and we, you know, I mentioned it in that intro is Okay, we're going to talk about her experiences over two years. We're going to talk about her ability to stay consistent. You know, those are the specific narrow topics that I want to get into. But then the conversation is going to evolve from there. But at least it's unique in its own way. And it's something that I can get excited about having a conversation about. Absolutely. Absolutely. And like for me, probably the intros. So I used to do a little bit of a longer, more static type of intro. And then I realized that for me, the excitement was the consistency in how I open, which always comes from my guest. So I have to be really specific about, tell me X, Y, and Z. And I can dig more into that. But essentially what I wound up doing, I think actually in the podcasting world is a little bit of a no-no, but I've made it work, I think. So there you go. (laughs) No, 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 please. Uh, All right. Now now you have my interest peaked as well as I'm sure the audience. Expand on what you're saying. (laughs) So my, typically folks do what you do, not as well. I'm just puffing you up now. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was really good. But there, I've done the research on my guests. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give them this beautiful intro and then they're going to come in. They're going to be confident. They're on stage. And so for me, I do the research on my guests, but I prompt them to tell me their story. And here's why. One, it could come off as really contrived and repetitive in a podcast. And you're like, so I have this guest. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yep. But but for me, it's not tell us a little bit about yourself. It's tell us the story of how you got where you are. And I do that very specifically because you'll find that especially women or folks who identify as female, their journey in this industry is so much less linear than so many others. And it's full of risks and it's full of setbacks and it's full of boulders and it's full of rude comments or sexual harassment or being told you can't because you smile too much or you can't because you don't smile enough. And so the idea of not tell me a little bit about yourself, but tell me your story of how you got to be a VP or an SVP or a C-suite in this industry. Every single story is different and incredible and none of them are linear or predictable. And every single one of them has this personal element of, I didn't think that I could, or somebody told me that I can't, or I experienced X and it it motivated me to go do Y. And so those stories are actually the entire basis of why we do the show. So it's technically a no-no, but it winds up working. Again, I hope. (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, I. it's funny that you say that because I did that no-no on this interview today. So it probably went right past you, but I I really, I opened up with, okay, Christina, I said, Christina, welcome. You said, thanks for having me on. And I said, I want to start with your journey. That yeah. was the first thing I said. And then I said, how did you know that podcasting was something you wanted to do? And I knew that that the answer to that wasn't going to be linear. You weren't going to say, okay, yeah, back in, you know, 2018, I started doing some webinar series. And then I was like, oh, a podcast is going to be a fit. I knew that it wasn't going to be linear. I And I knew, I think that the the important piece is, and I think what you're getting at, is when you ask that background question, tell me about your journey, tell me about yourself, whatever it may be, if you've done your homework enough on the guest or you know what your topic is, if you phrase it the right way, you know you're not going to get like, okay, yeah, so back in 2004, I graduated from you know XYZ University. From there, I took my first sales job. I was a BD, and you're like, you know, I was a BDR at whatever, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, uh, EMC making cold calls for data storage, and then I, you know, it, it, if you know your story and your guest enough to know what you're trying to tackle, I don't think that, that question is necessarily a no no. I think it's more about like. Are you setting up your episode well? And are you not going to bore the heck out of your audience? I think if you could do that, you could be successful with that question. Oh, totally. And not bore the heck out of your guest. Because yeah, yeah. that's that's the other thing is we, we want to entertain and delight the people who are listening to the content. And we want them to leave that episode feeling something, but something big. And that something could be 
joy, that something could be motivation, that something could be inspiration, that thing could be like anger or frustration, right? Like maybe you hear something that really kicks you off. We got a couple episodes where, you know, the content leans to, you know, particular viewpoints, right? And we go really, really hard. But am I making the listeners feel something big and meaningful? And is the guest leaving feeling like, wow, I just had a great conversation. Or are they like, God, I hope nobody hears this. That was terrible. We don't want yeah. That. And, and I think there is a sense of you having to know what you're trying to get out of those kinds of questions when you bring in a show as well. Because what I tell a lot of our customers is, and, and I think I've probably said to you, which is why you're like, Justin, I promise I'm doing this for a reason, which is sometimes if you do ask people that background question, they are just trying to do what you asked. And so if they talk for 15 minutes about their background, because you said, tell the audience about your background, that's not their fault. That's your fault. So if you don't know what you're going to get out of that question, please be careful with it because they may just be trying to do exactly what you asked and think they're doing a really good job. And really you're sitting there like, oh my goodness, when are they going to finish this answer? Because I actually want to get into the content, which, Christine, I'm going to do a little bit of a pivot here. This leads into my next question, which is the actual content itself. I'm curious, over this two-year period, after you've had, I think, going on 50 interviews, what kinds of changes and adjustments have you made to the episodes themselves and what you're putting out? I would say... I've gotten better at pivoting my guest when I need to cover more content, to constantly be thinking. I'll start it this way. When I first started recording, I recorded the episode. We had the conversation. And luckily, I had some really incredible guests. And those episodes were so, so strong. But I quickly realized that I was also going to have to, on the back end, while I'm participating in these conversations, think to myself, how much time are we at? Where do we have to go? What else do I want to make sure that I'm getting out of this episode? And sometimes... You have guests that are a little bit more shy and they're a little bit less talkative and they don't necessarily dive in and, and like circle around every answer. And so those folks, I have to pull more out of them and I have to be ready to really hard pivot them to get them where I know that they need to be. And on the flip side, you have some guests who are really, really open to talking, but they take side paths, they tell long mm -hmm. stories and you're like, oh my gosh, we're going to hit like, I've had some guests where we're at sitting in the opener. For like 20 minutes and it's unbelievably interesting but then I go oh my gosh we have a topic we have to hit and it's not for the show that we have to hit that but in my prep with every single guest I say what do you want to be known for what type of thought leadership do you want to exist in the world to be tied to your brand and what I'm going to do in this show is pull that out of you and put it on a platform for the world or this industry to see so what do you want to be known for it's a big responsibility. And so I have to make sure that I'm also doing my guest justice because they're spending their time with me. They're giving me their trust. And I can't say I'm going to elevate your thought leadership and then do an episode that's 45 minutes of them just telling their story. That's a fail on them, too. So over time, I've evolved to be able to look at the time and almost multitask better because I'm comfortable recording now. And so then I can keep us on track. I can pivot kind of like what you just did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to. We could have yeah. sat there. I can complain yeah. all day about bad intros to episodes and how I'm listening to a podcast. And I'm like, this is not like the I, I know you probably have not you, Christina, proverbial you of just listening to a B2B podcast out there. And I'm like, I know this person prepared for this. I know they have good content, but they're stuck in their intro. And they're talking to this person about their background and not that it's not interesting, but they need to get out of this and move on uh, so that the audience, so they don't lose the audience, right? You know, I mean, my job and what comes along with it is that I sit down with B2B podcasters and try and help them to have their podcast be successful. And one of the things that I tell them is don't sit there in the intro. So you and I could talk about that all day, but then you have to make, I have to say like, okay, you know, I know I have opinions on this, but it's time to move on to something else and to pivot that conversation. So on this front of how you have continued to evolve, so when the show first started and you set out to do this, have your goals changed at all in terms of the content that comes out of each episode? Like when you first started doing this, maybe you knew what you were going to get out of every episode and maybe you didn't and you had hopes for what you would get out of every episode. Compare that to 
what you now hope you get out of every episode. Maybe it's the same. Maybe it's different. I, I don't know, actually. Yeah, it's it's they're like they're almost cousins of each other. So when the show started again, I had never podcasted before. I had always done improv content, comedic content, theater content, film content, where it's all pre-written and all you're thinking about is how do I show up well and serve these lines or, you know, like make my audience laugh, right? Like, like that's what you're thinking through. I had never done anything quite like this before. And so I went into it with the goals of I want to elevate iconic women in this industry. I want to ask hard questions. I want to make it a comfortable yet potentially sometimes challenging environment or conversation to listen to. And I want this to be a show that features women, but isn't only for women. Right? Those were the ideas going into the show. And so I just went in and I was like, OK, I'm going to try to check those boxes. And over time, it evolved into me trying to find a way to bring that comedy edge that I have to the show. How can I make people laugh? How can I loosen it up? How can I get people out of their shell? How can I ask a difficult question in a really, really comfortable way? And how do I relate back to their story and bring it to where it is now? How do I inspire? It's almost like the start of the show, I wanted to hit all of my quantitative boxes and be like, I'm achieving these things. Mm -hmm. And then qualitatively, the show just turned into me figuring out all the pieces that I want to dig and almost bringing more heart to it, if that makes sense. So the goals haven't changed, but I would say that I am I am highlighting my guests so much more holistically than I was in the beginning of the show. Yeah, I mean, it's a great timeline for anyone to look at, which is you know what I try to tell people when they set out for podcasting is you want to have a good theme to your show. You want to say, you know, okay, this isn't just a show for insert your ICP here. What is the theme of the show? How does it help? Try and find some form of niche that you're going to be able to break through because at this point, there's 2 million podcasts that are out there more. You know, by being very generic or very broad, it's going to be tough for you to break through the mold. But perfection out of the gates is not what you should be striving for. You're going to learn things just like any anything that's competitive or anything in the world, right? Like your first day of doing improv, Christina, I'm sure you improved as you, you know, worked at it or a sport or anything along those lines. And I try and explain that to people is you're going to get better at being a host. You're going to get better at just podcasting in general. You're going to find things that you can only find by doing. Like you're not going to know the answers to how you want to evolve as a host, how you want to change the show, what you want to get out of the show with out doing it and that'll take and, and I what I tell people is it should be different you know your first episode to your 10th episode to your 25th episode to your 50th episode you should feel different at, along that way and what I see unfortunately with a lot of people is they want to have the skills of someone who's done it 50 times out of the gates right and then the problem is is that nothing ever happens 100%. If that were the way that you learned anything, people would try to sprint a marathon, right? And you're like, you just, you just can't. You've got to train for these things. And I'm going to continue learning and evolving and changing things. But absolutely, it's uncomfortable until it's not. But the first time that literally anybody does anything, it's uncomfortable and it's the first time and it's not perfect. And I also feel like that's a narrative in business that we could celebrate a little bit more is celebrating when people are doing things for the first time, making it safe for them to make those mistakes and fail forward. And, and that's another piece of it that we'll also hear through the incredible stories of these women is I made a mistake or that job wasn't for me or I identified that I should not have been there or I was communicating too emotionally or not emotionally enough. So it's like all of the learnings that we have with these various folks, they're all brought into it. And I take the learning as well, just running the show. And another thing that you mentioned when we were sitting in the green room before I hit the record button was your setup. You're like, yeah, you know, I'm trying, am I looking at the camera? And it's funny because you, again, you've been doing this for 50 episodes over two years. And so I wanted to talk about that a little bit, which is your physical setup, the equipment that you have, your location. Can you talk about your evolution of there and adjustments that you've made with your setup over the last two years? <laughs> I'm laughing because it's been ridiculous. The first time that I ever recorded anything, I did it in the closet of my office because I was so scared of the ambient noise from this window that I was like, I have to be in the closet. 
And that was weird and echoey and it didn't work. And then I was in an office and then I, I took my desk and I faced this window, had wonderful lighting, but then behind me was sort of lackluster like a bed. And so then I tried getting sort of like this wooden partition behind me and I was like, that looked a little bit better, but not quite, <laughs> you know, until finally I have the setup that you see now, which I think is objectively the best. And then the one thing that I did know about just from my artistic days was the kind of equipment that would at least produce somewhat great sound. So mm -hmm. I've got headphones that are kind of blocking out the outside world. So I'm not distracted by anything. I've got one of these Yeti mics. I'm going to move it, which you're going to hear, but one of these guys, I actually watched a couple of YouTube videos on how close you should be to something like this versus how far, like what the settings should look like. And then I've got my camera up here and depending on the technology I'm using, where I put the window that I'm recording often changes because growing up as being in the theater world or in the acting world, I am taught to interact with people directly. And interacting into a camera and not looking at the person that I'm talking to, really unnatural for me. So I've always <laughs> tried <laughs> to set it up so that my the person I'm talking to is right under my camera so that I can look at them and also be recorded, but it doesn't always work out that way. And then like I'm doing right now, I'm just talking to a little white dot, you know, and dying to look at your face, Justin, but I can't. <laughs> I know. The audience can probably see my eyes going, shooting <laughs> like, over to the boop, left. Boop, boop. I mean, you're talking about your environment, so I'm like trying to see trying what to you're look. saying. Yeah, but right. yeah, you know, I look directly into a camera, which has a teleprompter on it, which is where I keep my questions. But the, pur the purpose of me asking the question is, and again, Christine and I like to talk to each other, so we hung out in the green room and had some of these conversations already. Um, but, you know, I have people who come to me and they're like, I want to launch a $20,000 studio along with this podcast that I'm, that I'm launching. And, you know, I see people who have had these very successful shows and they build these things over time. A lot of times they start with a microphone. In your case, you weren't even doing video out of the gates. And I had to start to put a little bit of pressure on to get to the point where we were doing video, but you know, it was just an audio show with a microphone and I didn't know where you were recording because you weren't on video. And over time you have built out, you know, okay, now let's get, you know, let's get a nicer camera. And then at some point I said, Hey, Christina, so the, about the bed in the background, <laughs> what, <laughs> what can we do there? And I remember the partition and you asking me what I thought about it. And again, I gave you kind of like a, yeah, so that's okay. Um, and you're like, okay, I can read between the lines here. And you know, you've continued to level up your setup. You've leveled up what content you're putting out in terms of video. And the reason for me asking is it's been two years. And over that two year time frame, you know, it wasn't just a this needs to be perfect out of the gates episode one. There's been this slow but gradual but great build to get to the point of where you are today. And I imagine as time goes on, you'll continue to have changes and adjust things and want to work on things kind of like we all do. So, you know, that was really why I asked that question is it's, I think it's important for people to hear that again, you don't have to be perfect out of the gates and these things come with time. 100%. And like the, the little tweaks and iterations, we all do it. And don't let your equipment or your environment or your background or your makeup or your hair, or what you're wearing, any of it, stop you from just putting out great content. And we've been there, right? The minute that, Justin, you told me like, oh, we're going to start doing video, I was like, oh, I have to like get dressed for every episode. <laughs> and I was like, okay, you know, right? And it's like, you just come down to that. But really, it's it's okay. In fact, being not perfect sometimes is perfection. So just aiming, aiming for that. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, there's days where, you know, and I'm I'm a guy, so I'm not going to even try to compare to what I need to do. But, you know, there's days where I haven't, you know, put gel in my hair and done the whole nine. And I'm like, look, I'm th this I've already had eight meetings today and I have to do a podcast and I'm probably like sweaty from being in meetings all day. And you know what? I'm throwing some headphones on and we're doing this and I don't care because cool. I already have enough on my plate and I'm just not going to worry about it. And if the content's good, everybody can just take that content and enjoy it and not give me a hard time about it. 100%. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So the next piece, and this goes along with having to steer the conversation to make sure to get all of the content right. into an episode. Um, it's me. Uh, yeah, <laughs> is um, consistency. There's no secret that consistency in podcasting is a struggle. You know, I've heard numbers like 90% of podcasts fail before they hit 10 episodes. I don't know if that's 100% true or not because there are something like 
two plus million podcasts in the world and I don't have data on all of them. But I do know that I see podcasts pod fade out all the time. There's literally a term for it now called pod fade. And that only happens and you get a term when something happens a lot. I also know that one of the more difficult approaches to staying consistent in podcasting is when you have guest-based interview episodes because it requires more than just sitting down and doing it. It requires you to rely on someone else. You know, I do a lot of solo episodes and that makes it very easy for me. It can be a Sunday morning and I have my coffee down here in my little studio office and I'm like, look, I'm going to go knock out two episodes. I don't have to rely on anybody else. I write my script. I set up my camera. I've got a teleprompter here and I get it done. So I think the fact that you've done these episodes, 50 interviews over two years, every other week makes it even that much more impressive. So can you walk the audience through what your process is to make sure that you stay ahead of schedule and on track with your show? I do the best I can. One, there's no shortage of incredible women in this industry. So I'm never going to run out of people to interview. So that's that's a good problem. On the flip side, though, the content needs to be relevant to the now, especially because this was one of the shows that was born during the pandemic. And what we are going through sometimes feels like the landscape changes month to month or quarter to quarter. And the things that we are dealing with right now, especially things outside of work, like racial injustice, things like that, where we had so many of these issues that were that were happening within the landscape of when we were having conversations, that if I record too many episodes too early... By the time they launch, we're in a completely what feels like different decade than we were when I recorded it three months ago. So part of me started out wanting to just get as many as I possibly could and then say, OK, I'm great for content for the next four months. However, in B2B tech, we live quarter to quarter. Mm -hmm. Like I said, sometimes month to month. My God, sometimes day to day. Things are <laughs> wild. And so I need to make sure that I have guests that are lined up. I need to make sure that they feel empowered and ready to record without being overly prepped. I need to make sure that I'm not recording too many. Like if I go past two, two and a half months worth of episodes, I have to stop recording because relevancy is gone. And then you're listening to something and it's like accidentally watching an episode of Law and Order that you realize isn't the current episode or current season. And you're like, wait, when was this? I don't even want to watch this. This isn't relevant to me right now. Right. It's like it's got to be relevant to what's happening so that has actually been the hardest thing to balance is when I start to run low on guests, I need to record them, but keep the relevancy. <laughs> yeah. And then in this industry, you know how busy executives are. When we get to the end of any quarter or heaven forbid, the end of a year, asking for an hour of people's time is a lot and it's difficult. And I will often have times where I have, you know, happened the, the end of last year, I had four or five episodes all lined up to record to get me through quarter one. All of them pushed into Q1, right? And I, I can't push back and be like, come on. <laughs> My show is more important than like your job. Christmas isn't so. that important. <laughs> it's like, come on, right? What? Oh, yeah. end of month for you? Yeah. End of fiscal? What are you planning? Please, yeah. right? So it's not always easy to do that. And who knows? Maybe in the future, I'll record a couple or two by myself. But the show really is about highlighting my guests. If I get some highlight in there, amazing. But that's just, it's, there's too many women to feature that I just want to get to all of them. Yeah. And look, I don't even know if I know 50 people and you've conducted interviews with 50 people. And I, I know that you say there's not a shortage of women out there to interview, but you still have to find them. Right. You have to get to know who they are and whether or not they're going to be a fit on your show. So are there approaches that you're taking to make sure that you can meet these people? Like, are you doing anything like, hey, or, you know, when you have a guest on, are there other people that you know that are like yourself that you find impressive? Like, what are you doing to to fill that pipeline of people? I mean, you said they were pipeline. You're going to spark the sales leader in me. I have a solid inbound and outbound strategy. The, yeah, the no, inbound, great. Yeah, the inbound strategy is I get a ton of referrals. And those are people gender agnostic that reach out and say, I just saw this incredible person or I just talked to this incredible woman and they would be so amazing for your show. Can I introduce you? I get a solid amount of those. And then on the flip side, 
I will honestly cruise LinkedIn or whatever social channel or media, or if I see a company that does something really neat, I'll look into the company and I'll say like, who are the female leaders and who can I grab to like highlight while they're doing mm. something kind of neat? So there is like an inbound and outbound strategy and it's kind of always looking and always intaking. And, you know, the rough part is sometimes there is somebody who I know would be an absolutely incredible individual to talk to, but you do have to say no to guests sometimes when they're not in the right industry or they don't have the right experience or it's not going to connect because that's the other thing that I want the show to keep is focus, right? Mm -hmm. I can't interview every incredible woman in the world because we do have a lens where we are teaching people tactic and skills and how to be successful in this B2B SaaS landscape. Yeah. So I could hire, I could bring on a perfect, like a professional speaker who is incredible and motivating and wonderful. But if they're not in this industry, I'm sort of veering off path in terms of what the show's one of the show's core values. And so I also have to keep that in mind. Yeah, for sure. I've had to do the same thing with our show, which is niche in its own way, which is, you know, B2B podcasting. And, you know, I'll have people who are like, hey, you know, I talk to marketers too, and I'm a copywriter and I want to talk to you about how, you know, the what we're seeing in evolution of copywriting with AI. And I'm like, that that's very interesting to me. And we're looking into that stuff ourselves, but our audience is not looking to have that conversation and then you have to turn people down. So that's always fun. My last area that I wanted to tackle today is just the impact that running this podcast has had on you professionally. You know, you don't do this for two years every other week for no reason. There has to be something you are either personally or professionally getting out of this. So how has running an every other week B2B podcast impacted you as a professional over the last two years? Through helping other people realize that it's okay to be heard and it's okay to speak up and it's okay to give yourself a pat on the back, I've wound up doing the same thing. There are people that I don't know that I've never met all the time who will reach out on LinkedIn and say, I listened to your podcast and this episode specifically, and I'm going into XYZ meeting so much more inspired, or I have what I need. And being able to make an impact on people like that, I feel so lucky. So many people don't have the opportunity to do that. And so I can reach so many more people and I can encourage others to do the same because that's that's my whole idea is I want to show I want to show women. I want to show the people of the world who identify as female that your voice is important no matter what. And if you're not comfortable getting your voice out there, then I will help do it for you because we need we need more of that. We need more diversity and equity in this B2B landscape. And there's incredible people doing incredible things that never get their light. And in the past, I felt like that before. I felt like I'm doing incredible work and sometimes you're not seen. So feeling seen, being seen, and being able to make an impact on these individuals and an impact on this industry, it keeps me going. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and just to piggyback off of that, I'm curious because, you know, I view you as like this thought leader in sales and revenue and then also when it comes to like D&I stuff and I don't know. Sometimes maybe like I overplay my hand and you're like, Justin, I, I don't know if you see yourself that way as much as I do or other people do, but I'm curious from your perspective, how do you feel that Christina Brady pre-podcast and Christina Brady two years post starting the podcast is viewed differently in the professional landscape? God, it's such a hard question because, I mean, I'm guessing, right? I I know I have mo more folks that are exposed to my thoughts and my ideas and those of my guests, but I, I felt very siloed, we'll call it three years ago. I was one per person doing one thing passionately for that company that I was working for, and my reach outside of those four walls was extremely, extremely limited. And I knew that there were larger problems that I could solve and more things that I could do. But I was just Christina working at XYZ Company doing my thing there. It felt small in terms of impact outside of my company. Whereas now, 
I feel the impact and thus the responsibility so much larger and so much broader. But I remember the feeling of being somebody who cared so much and frankly gave a damn all the time to do this one thing, never thinking that anybody else would see it or hear it or appreciate it. And you start to associate that with your worth is I can do this one thing really, really well, but heaven forbid this one thing falls through because where is my worth outside of that? I remember that feeling. And if I, through bringing somebody on this show and featuring them in an episode, can help them to feel more like I exist outside of the company that I work for and no matter what, I will be okay, right? It's like that feeling of confidence where it's, what do they call it? It's career security, not job security. I think that's what having a voice and being able to be, as we call it, a thought leader can help you with is that career security, never feeling like the one job you're in can ultimately impact and ruin your life if they remove it because ev all of your eggs are in that basket, right? It's it's so much broader. And I just want that for more people, especially women and, and how they're impacted at work. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of the things that for me, so for the audience, I don't know how much you know about Motion's network of shows, which we're in the process of actually rebranding that and giving it a better name. But basically you run these six shows and you know, I host uh, Tristan, my business partner and co-host of the show. We host this one, but then we have a bunch of others that we run. And I think that we, we run as the pro production side of it. And we have these hosts and Christina, we have Camille Trent, Nick Bennett, Aaron Balsa, and we're launching a couple others with the juice, whatever. But I think one of the things that for me, I get the most joy out of doing these shows is that I watch these individuals be able to have something that is more than just their LinkedIn profile and a post every day, or maybe they have a Twitter. But, you know, Christina, I know if ever, you, and, and you can tell the audience I'm going to ask in a second where they can go to find you, where you're working, what have you. But let's say in a year or two years or five years, whatever, you're probably not going to retire at the company that you just took a job with. You're going to be out there looking for another thing. And one of the things that I think is so cool is these people that we work with on these shows, you know, they have this piece of intellectual property that they can point to and say, like, look outside of my job and, you know, here's my resume and here's what I do on a daily basis and here's how I'm going to help your company. But outside of that, like, and I'm not just an influencer and I'm, for the audience who's listening, I'm using finger quotes. I'm not just an influencer who posts on LinkedIn and gets a bunch of likes, but like I'm actually doing something. Like I'm doing something with the knowledge in my head to put out some kind of, in my opinion, awesome piece of content that is this podcast that I'm putting something back into the world. And I think personally, if you or Nick or Camille, and these are the other hosts of those shows, were to be head to head in a competition for a job that you really want one day that you can then point to this thing and be like, look at this thing that I've been doing for two years. I've done it every other week. Like you have a physical thing you can show somebody of the work and worth of what you do. And that for me is something that I get a lot of joy out of and why I think that you, Nick Bennett, Camille Trent, all these people are now getting on to two years of working with us on these shows that are a lot of work for you. And saying, hey, you know, I really feel like I'm building my own, I don't even know the term for it, but like I, I, I'm building my own legacy of who legacy. I am as a professional. And, and that for me is always fun to watch. Oh, the word legacy like hits hits a chord. And that's exactly it where, you know, what are what are we what are we doing here? What can we not take with us and what are we leaving behind, you know, and, and who exists in the room when our name is brought up and we're not there. Right. It's like that's that's what all of these things are going to build. But something around legacy is, is really, really important to my heart for so many reasons. You could learn all about them by listening to the show. <laughs> but it's the legacy, right? It's it's the there, there's a piece of me that is encapsulated somewhere. And that's not just me as the host. That's every guest that's been on the show can now point to that and say, what? I didn't host this show, but look at this show that I was on. Look at this show that I was on. You can hear me and see me in all of these different places. And it's legacy. That's exactly it. Awesome. Well, Christina, I think that's a good spot to end. We're coming up on our time here. I alluded to it already, but where can people go to learn more about you and what you're doing as well as taking the lead? Yes. So you can find a Taking the Lead podcast. I'll start there everywhere that you stream your favorite podcasting content. There is incredible cover art on that of a pretty red-haired lady who does me... Yeah. 
so much, so much justice when you first showed me that uh, the, the cover art. I was like, whoa! So you can find me anywhere that you uh, have your current favorite content. And then I'm also Christina P. Brady on LinkedIn. And then I am the SVP of sales at Speckit. So that is my new venture that I'm excitedly diving into. Awesome. Well, Christina, thanks again. I really appreciate you spending some time with me today. It was great having you on Recorded Content. Amazing to be here again. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Taking the Lead. If you're looking for more inspiring stories from women leaders in B2B tech, then visit us at motionagency.io slash taking the lead.